Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies, don't they? Isn't that so? The Haunted Haven by A. Erskine Ellis Attention all shipping. The Meteorological Office issued the following gale warning at 1600 hours. Southwesterly gale, force 8, imminent in sea areas Irish Sea, Lundy and Fastnet. In the southeastern angle of St. Bride's Bay, Sheltered from the southwest winds by the projecting tongue of land that ends in Wootak Point, nestles the little fishing village of Tickless Haven, which consists of an inn, a compact group of cottages, a stout jetty partly fashioned out of the living rock, and two snug little coves or havens, one on each side of the jetty. In the more northerly of these tiny bays, ten or a dozen fishing smacks may usually be seen, riding at their moorings, or lying in lopsided idleness at ebb tide. In the other cove, although it appears more sheltered and suitable in every way for use as a harbour, never a boat will be seen, nor any signs of human occupation, such as the lobster pots, coils of rope, nets and tarpaulins which litter the foreshore of the north cove. Four steep roads converge upon the village, two from the landward side and two from the coast to the north and the southwest. About a furlong up the more southerly of the landward roads, a hundred and fifty feet above the cluster of cottages in the haven, stands a ruined house, still known in the village as the doctor's house, although now deserted for some thirty years. Little remains of this once imposing and substantial dwelling, a mansion in comparison with the fishermen's cottages it dominates, save the ivy walls, through which the Atlantic gales shriek and wail, and the heavy wooden gate which creaks and bangs in the wind like demoniac artillery. For a quiet and restful summer resort, Tickless Haven is hard to beat, and I congratulated myself on my good fortune in not only discovering so cosy a nook, but in securing comfortable lodging at the inn. The landlord was a kindly and intelligent man of some fifty years of age, and his wife a cheerful and competent housewife, and an excellent cook. My days were mostly spent fishing for mackerel in the bay, taking long tramps up and down the rugged coast, or simply lolling amongst the soft lush grass on the cliff-tops, drinking in the glorious panorama of St. Bride's Bay, as it sweeps round in a majestic curve from Ramsey Island in the north to the Isle of Skoma in the south. When the weather was too boisterous for outdoor pursuits, there was the snug bar parlour of the inn and the rough but genial society of the fishermen who frequented it. It was there that I was sitting one August evening when the radio in the bar gave utterance to that ominous gale warning. At the mention of southwesterly gales, I perceived a sudden start among the fishermen present, and apprehensive glances were exchanged. Several boats were to be seen fishing in the bay, and one or two of the men walked to the door and peered out anxiously at the distant smacks. "'Glad I'm not out there now,' muttered one old salt. "'Hope my son William will get in before dark,' said another. This display of alarm was surprising, for the bay is sheltered to a great extent from the southwest wind, and in any case the boats were all near enough in to make harbour before being overtaken by the oncoming gale, of which the sky was already giving ample warning. I remarked as much to the innkeeper, who agreed that the boats were in no real danger, but added that nobody in Tickless Haven would willingly be out in the bay, or even in the neighbourhood of the harbour, after nightfall, when the wind blew strongly from the southwest. It amounted to a fixed tradition with them. I at once became eager to learn the origin of this strange superstition, and besought the landlord to enlighten me further. Well, it's a strange story, replied the innkeeper, and I can best begin by showing you a picture that a painter who stayed here many years ago gave to my grandfather, when he was landlord of this inn. So saying, he led the way into a back parlour, and pointed to an oil painting hanging on the wall in a dark corner. I took it down and carried it to the window, and saw that it represented the harbour at Tickless Haven, as seen from the beach at low tide. 
Although about 80 years old, the painting might almost have been done yesterday, for everything was depicted much as it is now, with one striking exception. The North Haven, where now all the boats are kept, was in the picture practically deserted, except for some children that play on the sand, whilst the South Haven presented just such a scene of activity as would be expected in so excellent a harbour. Half a dozen fishing boats lay high and dry at its entrance, while on the shingle sat a group of fishermen mending sails and nets. Two or three women were carrying baskets of fish up towards the village, and the usual litter of gear was scattered over the foreshore. In fact, the two little inlets presented an aspect just the reverse of their present-day appearance. "'Why is it?' I asked. "'That the South Haven, which seems so clearly the better of the two, has now been abandoned in favour of the other, which was apparently in use in your grandfather's day. That is precisely what I am about to tell you, replied the landlord. When I was a lad, that South Haven was still used, as you see it in the picture, and very few boats put into the North Haven, which is, as you observe, less sheltered and convenient. There lived in the village in those days three brothers who worked for their uncle, the owner of a fishing boat and gear. They were tall, strong young fellows, these three brothers, but of a morose disposition, and mixed little with other folk in the village. They were very hardy and fearless, and would put to sea in all but the most tempestuous weather, usually accompanied by their uncle, who was a first-rate seaman and could handle a craft in all seas. He was a grasping old ruffian, however, and on the strength of his ownership of the boat he appropriated most of the profits of the fishing, and allowed his nephews barely enough to live upon, with the understanding that on his death they would inherit his property. His niggardliness was a source of much discontent among the brothers, who bore their uncle no affection, and only continued to work for him in the expectation of some day possessing his wealth, which, owing to economy and judicious investment, was pretty considerable for a man in his position. One spring night, I was seventeen at the time, the four put to sea, although it was beginning to blow up a gale from the southwest, and the crews of none of the other boats would venture out. We watched them boating out past the stack rocks till they were hidden by the rain and darkness, and some of us wondered whether we should ever see them again. Early next morning the boat returned with no fish, and without the uncle. The brother's story was that he had been carried overboard by a huge wave, and had at once disappeared. It was useless to search for him, and they themselves were in great peril. They had a very rough time getting back, and the boat and gear were badly damaged. The three brothers seemed more upset about the accident than one might have expected, considering the unfriendly relations existing between them and their uncle, by whose death they now became comparatively well off. They were loud in their expressions of grief at their loss, and repeatedly cursed their folly in putting to sea on such a night. Two days later the uncle's body was washed ashore in the South Haven, where it was found by a fisherman in the early morning, actually caught on the anchor of his own boat. The body was carried up to the quay, where it was noticed that there was a long, livid bruise across the right temple. The doctor, who lived in that big house, now a ruin up the hill, examined the corpse, and at the inquest expressed the opinion that the bruise had been inflicted before death, and had been caused by a severe blow from some blunt instrument, such as a club or perhaps a tiller. The coroner looked up sharply at this, and asked if the bruise might not equally well have been caused by the deceased, striking his head against the mast or the gunwale of the boat in falling overboard. The doctor agreed that might have been the cause of the injury, but added that he could not believe that such a severe blow could have been inflicted in such a manner. The eldest brother was then re-examined as to what precisely took place, and deposed that his uncle had been knocked overboard by the boom suddenly swinging over and striking him on the head. This fresh testimony was corroborated by the other brothers, although previously they had all repeatedly affirmed that their uncle was simply washed overboard by a wave, and had made no mention of the boom. The jury, however, brought in a verdict of 
death by misadventure. The coroner was later criticised for not excluding two of the brothers from the court while the first was giving evidence. The deceased was buried next day in the churchyard at Walwyn's Castle. That was near the end of April. In the last week of May, the youngest of the three brothers slipped on the jetty when landing from the boat one dark night, there being a heavy sea running due to a strong southwest wind, and broke his neck on the rocks in the south haven below. Towards the end of June, the eldest brother, being harbour-bound by a southwesterly gale, was gathering mussels and limpets on the rocks at the far side of the south haven, when a large stone fell from the cliff above and smashed in his skull. Within a month the surviving brother was overtaken by a sudden squall coming up from the southwest while fishing out at Grassholm, and was washed ashore together with the wreck of his boat about a week later at almost the identical spot where his uncle's body had been found. The boat, so battered as to be no longer seaworthy, was hauled up on the shingle and left there to rot. The violent deaths of these three brothers, following so regularly one after the other, considered together with the suspicious circumstances attending their uncle's death, gave cause for much gossip amongst the village folk, and what had at first been but a vague uneasiness developed into general conviction that there had been foul play. Some nine months after the death of the last of the brothers, we had a spell of very rough weather, with strong gales from the southwest, and the fishermen were idle for weeks on end. A large amount of driftwood was cast up during these storms, and the men employed themselves in gathering and storing this for firewood. There was one old man in particular, now too infirm ever to go out fishing, who was to be seen early and late collecting this wood, and at low tide was always hobbling about the haven like some ungainly bird leaving off only when it grew too dark to see. One stormy night the old man failed to return home, and a search was made at daybreak. We had not far to look. His body was found wedged among the rocks in the south haven, with a ragged cut across the forehead. On his face was such a look of horror, as I pray I may never see again. The doctor said, that in his opinion the old man had received a bad fright and had started to run away, but had tripped over a boulder and stunned himself. He had then been drowned by the incoming tide. What on earth could have so terrified him was a mystery. Some three months later, when the wind was again blowing strongly from the southwest, a girl of fifteen, daughter of one of the fishermen, went over to the rocks beyond the South Haven to collect shellfish. She stayed too long, and was cut off by the flowing tide, but her parents were not worried, for she was quite safe, and had taken some food with her, and would be able to get back when the tide was low again at about 10 p.m. The sea was too rough for a boat to approach the rocks, and there was no way up the cliff, so she was just left to wait. At half-past ten that night, the girl suddenly burst into her home, screaming wildly and clearly crazed with terror. She had gone completely out of her mind, and howled and raved like a maniac. Her cries soon attracted a crowd to the cottage, and someone went and fetched the doctor. He could do nothing to calm the child, however, and had to put her under sedation. After being left under observation for a day or two, she was taken away to the asylum, where she died soon afterwards, without recovering her reason. The most extraordinary feature of this sad case was what the poor child kept repeating in her insane ravings. It was all about dead men, the four dead men, she would screech, the dead men in the boat, and could utter nothing but incoherent phrases about the dead men. This second case of severe fright, uh, following so soon after the death of the old wood-gatherer, and in the same place, namely the South Haven, created a considerable stir amongst the villagers, and their fears were further increased by a peculiar occurrence which had been noticed several times 
and by many witnesses, including myself, namely, that on the morning following a southwesterly gale, tracks were seen in the sand, leading down to the sea from the derelict boat, as if it had been launched and beached again during the night. This was humanly impossible, as a brother's boat could not have floated for a single minute, but there the tracks always were, at dawn, after a high wind from the southwest, provided they had not been obliterated by the flowing tide. One evening, shortly after the death of the poor demented girl, the doctor came into the bar parlour here and asked to have a few words with my father in private. They came into this back room, and the doctor told my father that he had been all round the village endeavouring to persuade someone to spend a night with him by the wrecked fishing boat in the South Haven, when next the southwest wind blew gale, in order to try and solve the mystery of those tracks in the sand. But not a man would go near the place after dark, for love, no money. The doctor then asked my father if he would watch with him, for otherwise he would go alone, and it was desirable to have more than one witness of whatever took place. My father, though not at all liking the job, eventually undertook to keep the doctor company. It was not until the autumn equinoctial gales began that a suitable opportunity for the investigation occurred, but at last the wind blew so strongly from the southwest that the boats were unable to put to sea. At about ten o'clock, one cloudy night, the doctor called in for my father, and the pair of them went down to the South Haven. They found a sheltered corner amongst the rocks in full view of the wrecked boat, where they made themselves as comfortable as they could, and began their watch. My father afterwards said that he had experienced only one thing in his life more unpleasant than the beginning of that vigil, and that was its end. The wind, now blowing a whole gale, sent dense masses of black clouds hurtling across the moon, which intermittently shone forth upon as wild a scene as could be imagined. Even in this sheltered corner of the bay the breakers were dashing high up the rocks, while farther out the sea seemed to have gone mad and was foaming in tempestuous fury like a living thing in torment. No fishing boat could have weathered such a storm for a moment. So fiercely magnificent was the view across the bay that the two watchers became absorbed in contemplating it and forgot about the boat on which they were supposed to be keeping an eye. Suddenly my father's gaze was diverted by a movement on the sand below, and he grasped the doctor's arm and pointed, There! Halfway between its normal resting place and the edge of the surf was the wreck of the fishing smack, while four men, two on each side, were hauling it down the beach. The doctor gave a shout and began to clamber down from his perch on the rocks, but the men at the boat seemed not to hear the cry. They rapidly dragged the derelict down to the sea, launched it, and climbed aboard. Two of the men put out oars and started to row. One took the helm, while the fourth, stationed himself in the bows. Then the old tub, with great rents in her sides and a hole in the bottom that a man could have crawled through, put out to sea, and was quickly lost to view. My father and the doctor stood by the edge of the sea like men thunderstruck, until the incoming tide wet their legs and recalled them to themselves. They then went up the beach to make sure that it was the wreck that had been thus miraculously launched, and found that it was indeed gone. There could be no shadow of doubt that four men had put to sea in a near hurricane with a boat that would not normally have floated for ten seconds. There was nothing for it but to await the possible return of these uncanny mariners. So, the two men returned to their former position on the rocks and kept a tireless watch upon the stormy sea. Shortly after two o'clock in the morning, their vigilance was rewarded by the sight of a boat approaching from the direction of the stack rocks. 
It drew rapidly in shore and proved to be the old fishing boat with her mysterious crew, who appeared quite unaffected by the mountainous seas, and beached the boat as easily as if it had been a dead calm. The four men then dragged the boat up to its habitual place on the shingle and moved off in single file towards the village. The doctor immediately jumped down and ran across the beach so as to intercept them, followed by my father. These two reached the foot of the quay where they waited for the four men to come up. On they came, walking stiffly in line until they were abreast of the watchers, when the clouds covering the moon blew apart, and there was revealed a spectacle that sent my father tearing blindly across the beach and turned the doctor sick and faint where he stood. Those four men were the long-dead and buried brothers and their uncle. The doctor, rallying from the first shock, continued to gaze in horror as they passed. In front, marching with no movement beyond a mechanical swinging of the legs, was the old man, a great livid wheel across the side of his forehead. Behind him, with the same mechanical gait, stalked his three nephews, the first with his head all crushed and bloody, the next swollen and bloated and covered with a tangle of seaweed, and the third with his head hanging on one side at a horrible angle. So the four dead men walked up from the sea, and the doctor, overcome with dreadful nausea, collapsed in a dead faint. The spray blowing over the jetty brought the doctor round from his fainting fit, and he tottered to his feet. The ghastly procession had vanished, so he went in search of my father, whom he found lying insensible on the shingle in the North Haven, having fallen and struck his head on the prow of a boat. Help was summoned, and my father was carried home, but it was many days before he was sufficiently recovered to attend to business, and he never altogether got over the shock he received on that awful night. Meanwhile, the doctor resolved to have the old fishing boat destroyed in the hope of putting a stop to these supernatural proceedings. Not a soul in the place would go near it, so the doctor, single-handed, built up a pile of brushwood around the wreck and set it alight. The whole thing was soon consumed, and the ashes were cast into the sea, so that not a trace remained. At eleven o'clock that very night, as I was shutting up the inn, four men passed up the street, walking stiffly in single file. I hastily closed and locked the door and ran up to my bedroom, the window of which overlooked the street. It was too dark to see much, but something about the figures filled me with dread and the rearmost carried his head at an unnatural angle. I watched them until they turned up the hill leading to the doctor's house, and then went to bed. A little later I fancied I heard a scream coming from the hill, but it was not repeated, and may merely have been a seagull crying. Next day the woman who used to do for the doctor came back to the village in great distress, saying that she had found the door open and the doctor gone. Search was made along the shore and all over the neighbourhood, but without success. A few days later the doctor's body was washed ashore by a high tide in the South Haven and was deposited on the very spot where he had burnt the boat. So, now... You can understand why we at Tickless Haven avoid that South Haven and fear the southwest wind. But do the dead men still haunt the haven when the southwest blows? I asked. Nobody ever goes there to see, replied the innkeeper. If you like that story, consider supporting me as a patron. That way you help me make more stories for you and get access to a patron's only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? For now we're going to ignore the uh, elephant in the room, which is my accent, doing that. And we shall say something about Arthur Erskine Ellis. 
So Arthur Erskine Ellis was a distinguished biologist and teacher for over 50 years, with many scholarly papers and books to his credit. These became the standard reference text for identifying the non-marine mollusca of Great Britain, Br Great Britain and Ireland during the most of the 20th century. He was also a lifelong devotee of ghost stories, encouraged by an early meeting with Montague Rhodes James. Peace be upon him. He was born on the 1st of October 1902 in Bangalore, Bangaluru now, where his father worked for the Indian government. Both of his grandfathers were important figures in British Railways, one being superintendent of the Great Eastern Railway. On returning to England, Ellis was educated at Kingswood School in Bath, Bath and, Se and Senior no, and Signor Edmund Hall in Oxford. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say that. S R. I don't know if it's sen Signor. Mm, some, somebody will tell me. At an early age, he became a plant collector, and from 1919 to 1961, he contributed many specimens of sperm, spermatophytes to a number of different herbariums in Britain. He's just trying to trip me up now with these words. In 1925, he was appointed the first biology master at Lansing College, where he met M. R. James. 1925, remember, Ellis set out several of his own ghost stories. He's a generation after James, you know, uh, in the 1920s, notably his most Jamesian tale, If Thy Right Hand Offend Thee, which takes place at St. Chris Chrysostom's, I know that, that means Goldmouth College in 1925, closely based on Lansing, and also features a biology master, Mr. Matthews. Ellis expanded his university thesis into his most important book, I don't have a copy of this, British Snails, a guide to the non-marine gastropoda of Great Britain and Ireland, placed the scene to recent, published in 1926 by the Clarendon Press, available on Amazon. I bet it is, actually. Shortly after they published M.R. James's standard work on the apocryphal New Testament, this is Clarendon Press. Yeah. And he wrote a lot about um, mollusks, and in 31 he became fellow of the Linnaean Society and became head of the biology department at Epsom College, where he stayed for... 30 years. After his retirement for teaching and reaching the age of 70, Ellis started to offer his ghost stories to editors and anthologists, beginning with Robert Aikman, peace be upon him. In his first seven volumes of the Fontana book of great ghost stories, Aikman had a long-standing rule not to include any brand new tales by modern writers, apart from himself. That actually sounds like my new policy for this channel. No new tales by modern writers apart from myself. Yeah, so I mean, you know, me and Aikman, that's a great company to be in. The first time this rule was broken was the lead story in the eighth volume, 1972. As Aikman stated in his introduction, trains are eerie and boats have a mystery that rarely attaches to helicopters. So here we have Mr. Ellis's The Haunted Haven. This is Aikman saying with some really nasty phantoms and notably apt to be met with on a cold weather holiday. Um... Ellis returned to another spooky fishing village in the West Country with his next story in the 10th Fontana book of great ghost stories. And R. Chetwind Hayes commented in his introduction, A. E. Ellis was at one time a master at two public schools and during that period wrote a number of ghost stories which afforded pleasurable thrills to his young pupils. Now that pleasure, now that pleasure is extended to a wider audience with the first appearance of The Chapel Men, written by an author whose father was a Wesleyan minister living in West Cornwall at the period of this story. This is a marvellous piece of macabre writing. This is Chetwin Hayes saying, this is a great man. I don't go as far to say peace be upon him for him. I think he's good. But um, M.R. James, Robert Aikman, peace be upon them. His next ghost story, If Thy Right Hand Offend Thee, first appeared in Mary Danby's anthology. Great anthologist she is. I was talking about her last night. Um, and her, I'm guessing it's her husband, Richard D Danby. Um a. E. Ellis, anyway. So he, he liked to be called A. E. Ellis following the similar example of James M. R. James, E. F. Benson, R. H. Molden, L. P. Hartley. There's loads of them, isn't there? J. R. R. Tolkien, C. P. Snow. <clears throat> it was the thing. I should be J. A. Walker. I think I might do that. So I got this book. Let me tell you something about this. It's uh, I've got this copy of this by Phantasm Press. Cost £7.50. Uh, that's a book price. And I got it. Um, it's it's actually uh, Phantasm Press. It is uh, this was in 2016, so that's eight years ago. Uh, but it was um, it's Phantasm Press is based in Scarborough, <coughs> in York, North York's. Now, I got it in about 2019. How time flies when we were we attended the um, folk horror revival shindig in Whitby. 
around in the in, it was near Christmas, early December actually, and uh, I went to the bookshop in Whitby. And if, I love Whitby so much. Uh, and um, if you've never been to Whitby, do you? And it, you know, it's easy for you to get to. And if you're living in uh, Bora Bora, it might not be that easy. But if you're in any way striking distance, if you're making a a visit to the UK, if you're not from the UK, and uh, you want to go to some atmospheric haunted places, I can offer you an itinerary. If anybody would be interested in that, I did used to do ghost tours of the UK, so I've got some ideas. If you want to go, and I could, I mean, take me, a, you know, an afternoon to knock it up, but um, I could do that for you. I would certainly include Whitby for if you're doing the north of Britain or north of England and southern Scotland, probably that would be a tour. And um, it's great, and there's a great bookshop there on um, Church Street, and there's lots of shops selling Whitby Jet there. It's such a great town, I love it. Um, there are certain places I really, really love, um, and I mention them in these rambles. So I got it there, uh, and there was a couple of books. What was the other one? I'm going to go off the mic so my voice will sound funny a little bit, and I'll tell you which was the other one I got on the same day. <clears throat> I got Daydreams and Nightmares by Catherine Hayes, also by Phantasm Press. And uh, all being well, I think she might actually be alive. I think she might be alive. So I probably have to ask her permission. Sorry, how la how lax of me to do that. In the early days, I would have edited that out and I would, it would have been very smooth, but now you just hear me turning around. You may also hear, the dogs are up here with me. They're being good. We've been out for a walk and uh, they're both asleep. But Ruby snores. Uh, and so she, I had to cut some of that out because she was snoring and redo it. I don't mind, though, because I love her so much. My little Ruby Doobie. Uh, and my big boy, Jasper, who's there. <clears throat> my faithful hound. As I call him, me great swat hound. So Whitby, I was extolling the virtues of Whitby. And of course, this story is also set by the sea, as Whitby is, but on the other coast. So this is in Pembrokeshire in southwest Wales. And Pembrokeshire is a really interesting and beautiful county. Um, and I used to go out for ooh, a few years with... Um, um, a girl whose dad was from Haverford West, and though they didn't live there anymore, that's in Pembrokeshire. Um, they had a uh, one of these. Um, he'd inherited it from his mother because in the thirties and things, people the, the planning laws weren't so strict. This is true on the coast where I am as well. Or I used to live in Allenby on the Cumbrian. There's Ruby. Do you hear that? On the Cumbrian coast, and um, they're not allowed to build them now. But they used to build shacks and uh, they'd make themselves quite luxurious dwelling places, you know, of wood and um, uh, tar, tar felt roof stuff. And um, yeah, they had one of these in, in Solva. No, not Solva, in Newgale, just south of Solva, in fact. And so I went, I got to know Pembrokeshire quite well. We used to go there quite a lot to, to stay there. Um, and obviously I lived in Aberystwyth for about four years, five years on and off, four years and then another year later on. And so uh, if when I had my car, I would go down the coast to Pembrokeshire. So very, very beautiful. Again, like Whitby, if you have a chance to go to Pembrokeshire, go to St. David's, go to um, um, Aberdeen, Fishguard. And, uh, and the other interesting thing about Pembrokeshire is when the Normans came, they settled a colony of Flemings and English people on the south coast to kind of like a plantation like later on in Elizabethan times was done in Ulster to <clears throat> like colonial stuff like in South Africa or um, the United States or, you know, um, the, you people go and settle and you settle your own people to have a friendly presence there to your own power gains, I suppose, is what we are. I'm not trying to be political. That's another point. I was discussing last night in the book club, you know, sometimes... Um, people do get political and I don't want this to be you believe what you want and uh, this is just to entertain you this channel honestly the stories they're not meant to kind of rile people but anyway going back to the um, 12th century 13th century settled Flemings and, and so um, it became an area of English speaking so South Pembrokeshire has lots of English names actually English language names and there's a line that was maintained for many, many years called the Lanska. And where I was saying about Newgale, so if you go a bit further north, the names are in Welsh. Solvay, Solvach, and uh, Penacum and places like that. 
and and then south the names are English, and um, and this line was maintained, and so South Pembrokeshire has been English speaking with its own particular accent that sounds, it sounds, it's not even Devonian. It's uh, it um, although it has things in common with Devon, but uh, it's it's quite an extraordinary, and I think it's under threat, you know. And I didn't do that this time. I did a kind of a te- oh, here's the, the accent, the um, uh, bog standard uh, kind of um, South Wales accent. Um, more, well, you'd be the judge of whether it's, whether it's successful or not. Um, so yeah, um, and that's it. Now I was going to say another. When I was later on in the nineties, and I wasn't living on the west coast of Wales, I was living in mid Wales, up in Montgomeryshire. But I had a job working for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, and they said prevention of birds, uh, which I always I've probably done that joke as well. And my <clears throat> Boss there was a guy called Roger Lovegrove, who, and you may see in some of my stories, there is actually Mr. Lovegrove, um, and I just borrowed his name, but he was the best boss I ever had. Coincidentally, he was born and brought up in Carlisle, where I live now, and his dad was a um, a Conservative Party agent, and I hope, I hope you know, he, he died this year. Uh, he was a good age, and uh, honestly, what a man he was. He was he was a fantastic man. He, he took no nonsense, but he let you do. You know, he was basically saying, "Right, there's this project to do, Tony. Here's this money, do it." And every month I'd go back and go, "We've done this," and he'd go, "Fine, fine." And he just let me do it. It was the most amazing job I had. Um, it was about the red kites. We were. It was a tourism project with the red kite, Milvus Milvus, and it was, uh, was to encourage ecotourism in 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 Wales. The later job. When that was finishing, we started to get stuff together for a job whereby, and this was cut, this we're talking about mid 90s, and um, it was about we were going to put cameras all around the Welsh coast and, um, and beam them in to use, which is very commonplace now. But in those days, it was like technically difficult and really, um, really expensive. And we had to kind of um, design like wind turbines and solar panels to because a lot of the cameras were in pretty remote places and we we're going to have underground ones anyway this is leading to the point ultimately and the point is that we one particular summer's day and it would have been the summer of 96 because my wife at the time melanie was heavily pregnant with my daughter's twin girls and we and it was a glorious day and i drove down with, and met them down there. I drove down from Montgomeryshire, right through Cardiganshire and Pembrokeshire. And I remember thinking, there's not a mile of this that isn't beautiful. Uh, it was, and it was a glorious day as well. But, um, you know, it was such a beautiful countryside. And we get to um, uh, down there and we got a, um, a boat to Ramsey Island and we had a look around. And then we were going in a small boat over the sea to Grassholm which was a, is a gannet colony and very um, scientifically important. And Melanie was too heavily pregnant and the advice was, you know, don't come in the boat. So I went, poor Melanie. She, I think she was okay. She just sat there and enjoyed the sun. But um, this, the sea was like glass, honestly. We got the boat from Ramsey to Grass, Grass, uh, Grassholm and circled it. And um, and then we didn't land because it's full of gannets and it smelled disgusting because it's got guano on it. So you get the wind... But there were dolphins, there were petrels, there were um, porpoises. It was the most amazing day. So it's funny how these little gems from your life, and that is my, that is the same coast that he's talking about there. I was, I was one of those boats out there that particular day. Um, what a great time it was. What else was I going to say? Yeah, changing the subject, I suppose. I don't know if you've noticed uh, on the YouTube, so if you don't follow me on YouTube, have a look over. I have got a new cable. Um, I love cables. And it is for my camera, so I can do live live storytelling. And I did one of one of my own stories from Further Ghost Stories. There were some technical... Pro- Actually, the sound quality was okay. The picture quality was was technically okay, although I... I um, I had it set for natural light, and of course it wasn't. It was night, so I was too orange, and also the camera the camera was fixed, so you could see the top of my head. And when I was 
when I was dipping down to read, you could see you see my forehead. And then when I'm looking back and I'm thinking, where did all my hair go? I, you know, I definitely did. I'm not imagining it. I used to have more hair than this, and I do not remember selling it or getting rid of it. It just seems to have gone of its own accord. Uh, but, you know, so um, I'm going to do another one. I'm going to do, I think I'm going to try one this Wednesday, and then I'm going to do one on Halloween. And I don't know what I'm going to do on Halloween. Um, I, I'm thinking of a Lovecraft for Halloween. Um, either Dreams in the Witch House, which is about an hour and 30 minutes, um, and or um, Rats in the Walls, which is about 50 minutes. The... The point, I remember once doing a live and I started off and you, I, can't, I won't be able to see the comments because I've got the cable. So I, I'm looking at the camera so the computer and the screen with the comments is away. Uh, it actually goes out the same time on Facebook. So if you follow on Facebook, if you follow Classic Ghost Stories podcast on Facebook, you get it on Facebook. Uh, it's the same broadcast. I can't see the comments is my point. So, um, the, but I later saw one that was like, I was checking my levels, and this guy, oh, this guy, he hasn't even, I don't know if he was American, really, I knew he did an American accent, but, um, you know, he was like, he hasn't even sorted his levels out, I, what an amateur, I'm out of here. So, um, how rude, I thought. But anyway, there we are, so I'm going to do that, that's thing, going to do lives. I might do them more often, I like doing them. Um, we'll see how we get on. It's all about trying different things, isn't it? And then the next thing is my Etsy shop. So you may know of the, um, I may have bored you about the Amazon debacle whereby they they got into their heads and broken something. And even though the publisher with the trademark that said, you know, just correct it, it'll be fine. And they just went, do, and I, no, no, this is our final communication. And it was some call center uh, somewhere. And, the, you know, you had these people. And I'd been on there for 10 years. So I lost a chunk, not a huge chunk these days of my income, but some, you know, I think probably about worth about £200 a month. So it's better than a kick in the teeth. Um, but, and, you know, it's not great to, loss, to lose it. But anyway, I then went and published my books on Ingram Spark, so you can order them from your local bookstore, which may be relevant later when the next thing i'm going to say is and then i said and i've ordered some so i'm looking at piles of my books here in my this top room which was it which is increasingly resembling some kind of warehouse um and to, to sheila is great unhappiness uh she says you know it's not very well organized and you need to organize. and i thought oh yeah but you know oh dear so that'll come that reorganization of the room I've got to get rid of some books, reading books first, not my books, but books I read. I need to get rid of them. Anyway, so I've got piles of books. So I had an experiment and I put created an Etsy shop with my books. I thought, I'll sign them for you. I'll post them out. However, it soon transpired that postage outside the UK for heavy things like books is unbelievably expensive. For example, somebody bought, very kindly bought seven of my books. And I think all of that together was... Uh, you know, let's say with postage, I think I charged them five pounds postage or shipping or whatever you want to call it. And uh, it, I think I've got about, you know, 70 odd quid, maybe 75. The postage cost 40 pounds. And then another one, another lady bought two books. Postage cost 20 pounds to the US. So it just isn't worth it. So the point about your local bookstore is now it's through Ingram Spark. If you want to have one of my books, which I encourage you, of course, um, you order them through your local bookstore. However, what, what's in my Etsy shop for you? So if you're in the UK, please, 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 please buy my books through my Etsy store. It's Classic Ghost Stories. Classic Ghost Stories on Etsy. I'll put a link in, in the YouTube video, um, probably in the show notes as well of the podcast. Yeah, Etsy's good for me if you were in the UK. I can post it out to you and I can sign it. What about if you're not in the UK and um, you want to go to my Etsy store, which, what's for you? Well, I thought about this, I scratched my head and I thought, I'll tell you what, I'm going to produce a series of postcards based on the thumbnails I use for the YouTube channel because some of them have been good and people have commented how, how striking they are. So there's a set of three postcards and a kind of sticker 
classic ghost stories sticker which i think i'm I, that i've ordered them they haven't arrived yet i'm going to put them on my etsy store so keep looking and because they're light they're postable and so you know it's merchandise isn't it i may get a badge or a pin made um as well depending on costs and sell these kind of things this through the etsy store um sheila wants to give up work you know at the hospital and so i said listen you can you can run the etsy store but it has to actually make some money first so you know not spending 60 quid on postage um yeah so oh okay if you are in the uk and you want to buy or if you're not in the uk the, a fantastic christmas gift a little stocking filler for somebody in your life would be my um christmas ghost stories book it's got nine stories in if you if you're familiar with the podcast you probably heard me read them the mine it's very well reviewed or it was before amazon destroyed my reviews and deleted it um and yeah it's a great thing just buy it I, you know if you're in the uk i can sign it if you're not unfortunately i can't but i'll sign it with my love um if you're not and order through your bookstore i'll put a link up yeah fantastic D don't you know come on come on call to action buy my christmas ghost stories book and give it to somebody for christmas okay there you are that's a naked not a power grab but a money grab um there we are okay so i need to go um because chloe who i used to work with who's only young it's her birthday and she's very kindly in she's only 24 so and she's kindly invited me with her friends to go for drinks in town i'm <laughs> like um yeah all right so i i'm gonna sh you know what we do don't tell her this she's a lovely girl but they'll all be young they're gonna be on the raz aren't they they're gonna be on the lash and uh carrying on and singing in karaoke's and dancing and having boys come up to them and I, you know i don't know I, it's all beyond me now all of that it's, i'm past it all of that stuff so all i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go and say hi i'll have one drink and i'll go and I've got a little bag. Sheila's given me a gift bag. And Sheila makes, as you know, she forages for stuff. And it's not just foraging. I think that she's got some coffee, coffee soap that she makes with coffee. Obviously, she doesn't forage for coffee in the UK. But um, she's rose hip this, that and the other and um, slows and damsons and um, cleavers she does it a lot of. Rose Bay willow herb tea. And so she does all of that. So... I said to her, it would be very nice if you give me a little bag, Sheila, and um, this can be part of your new job. Uh, but the problem is, if Sheila is my employee, it won't work like proper employees because she will just keep telling me what to do. And I'll say to her, employee, will you do this? And she'll go, no. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Right. Okay, I'll do it myself then. And that kind of defeats the point of having an employee, but... You know, there we are. So anyway, but very kindly, she's um, put together a bag of gifts. So I'm going to give to young Chloe. And Emma might be there and all of those. I used to work with Emma. And um, I, I one drink, then I'm gone. And then I've got to pick Sheila up because she's in a mind-body-spirit today. She's got a, like one of these fairs that she goes to in Penrith. And uh, she's coming back at tea time. And then I need to give her a lift to somebody's 60th birthday party. So that's why I'm only having one drink, and by that time it will worn off, because um, it's only about two o'clock now, and um, and then I've got to give a lift back. So what a busy day I've got! You'd be pleased to know my mum's back out of hospital. I brought her back out of hospital on Tuesday. She's getting old, eh? It, it's not a lot of fun getting old, and and she's, um, you know, arthritis, and and she had bleeding ulcers and all sorts of stuff, and so, but you know, she's home, and she and I was with her. I stayed there on. Thursday, so Friday, my daughter Imogen went round Wednesday. I think my nephew Robert was round yesterday. My brother might have been round as well. And uh, my other daughter, Catherine's going either today or tomorrow. But, you know, we have to rally round for a... Um, yeah. Anyway, on that thought, buy my Christmas ghost stories. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Of course, as an addition... If you're in the unfortunate position where you've got no money, and that happens, I've been there. I remember having to sell my little plus, my little portable black and white TV, and I was living in a caravan, that is to say, a trailer, uh, and um, with my cat Mungo. 
and I had no money and I had to sell stuff in order to get food. So I know what it's like to have no money. So even though I'm kind of making a naked money grab for you to go and buy my uh, book, if you haven't got any money, don't worry about it. I love you anyway, okay? I love you by, for listening and being part of this community because it kind of is a community now. It's really lovely. All right, that is. I better go and go to the pub.